Okay, comrades, welcome to this session. Uh, my name's Corey, I'll be chairing it. Uh, it's the palaces of reaction, the role of the House of Sword in, the modern, in, modern, in modern Middle Eastern capitalism. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, do, 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 do. What I just have to tell you about. Before we start, I'll just tell you about dinner, which will be served uh, from the food trucks, which are outside the, the Red Flag Bar, which hopefully you all know where that is by now. Um, the talk is going to be given by Omar from the Sydney branch, and I'll let him get going. Yeah. Um, I haven't said anything yet. Um, so, why talk about Saudi Arabia? Well, the first thing, first reason is Yemen. People be aware of what's happening there. It's a bit of an a interesting situation, which uh, numerous Middle Eastern leftist organisations are concerned about being, part, being the key focal point for the entrenchment of the counter-revolution in the Middle East and the start of sectarian tensions uh, and the, the raising up, the ratcheting up of sectarian tensions. Saudi Arabia is obviously key behind the coalition of countries that are bombing that country right now. The second thing is Egypt. Seriously understand what's happening in Egypt uh, in the counter-revolution there, the military regime, SCAF, uh, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces. To understand that, I think you need to understand Saudi Arabia. To understand the situation in Palestine, Syria, all these other countries, I think Saudi Arabia is a linchpin of the region. So anyone who's interested in the Middle East, I think needs to understand the nature of Saudi Arabia. It's not just the Middle East. Those who are interested in the world economy, understanding the geopolitical ramifications of oil prices, of, of, of finance, of a whole range of issues, Saudi Arabia is at the core of that. Uh, and currently, the fact that oil prices are about half of where they were uh, about a year ago, uh, Saudi Arabia is a significant player in that game. Um, in the world of finance, the Saudi Arabian investors have about three quarters of a trillion dollars currently invested in the United States, one of, one, making it one of uh, the biggest investors in that country from a single geographical location. So if you're interested in economics, Saudi Arabia is crucial. The final thing I think is Saudi Arabia is particularly, it's pleasurable to study because it highlights all the hypocrisy of the global capitalist system in some of the most wonderful ways. Uh, and it's not just, I guess it's symbolic of the entire Gulf region really. The extraordinary wealth that's been accrued in these countries and the extraordinary barbarity alongside that. Um, and this is not about Saudi Arabia, but it reflects the broader thing. Um, there's been a university opened up in Abu Dhabi uh, this year. New York University has opened up a branch. And when the president of that university was asked, oh, aren't you concerned about the relations with Abu Dhabi being a you know, dictatorship? You're meant to be an academic institution. Uh, the president of this university said, no, no, this is not a dictatorship, it's a monarchy. And I would like to call the king uh, a philosopher king. <laughs> and, uh, and this is the kind of subservience, the disgusting attitudes of the Western ruling class and Western intellectuals, many of them, to the Saudi regime. So the hypocrisy is extraordinary. But it's also the Saudi regime itself uh, which is extraordinarily hypocritical and cynical. Um, I watched a little uh, ABC News report done last year on the Saudi government, and um, this interviewer asked that one of the richest Saudi princes, oh, what are you doing here in Spain? You know, like your people, are, many of them are hungry, poor. Um, don't you think it's a bit extravagant to be flying over here to Spain? And they, they picture the yachts. Uh, this particular individual had about seven yachts in the, floating in the harbour uh, in Spain. And he was like, and, he, and his family were on ski doos and so on. And just the, the visual scan to all this. And he says, no, no, we're just, we're just a family on holiday at the beach. <laughs> and, 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 when, and when asked then, like, what is the relationship between uh, the government and the people of Saudi Arabia, he, pr he said proudly, and I want to quote this, because he said, it's ideal, it's further than ideal, it's a utopia. <laughs> so this is seriously how this, this regime wants to present itself. So for utter hypocrisy, there's no better place to learn about and study than Saudi Arabia. There's three things I want to do in this talk. Uh, I want to understand the nature of the specific form that capitalism takes, in Saudi Arabia. I want to understand its role in the region uh, and in the Middle East, uh, but also globally. Uh, and I want to understand uh, the prospects and hopefully uh, and, and challenges that the government will face, uh, which will hopefully lead to crisis and change. And in particular, the relationship between Saudi Arabia and America uh, is, is one that needs to be investigated. Um, there's, some, there's a few funny facts, actually, that I discovered in looking at this. Um, Saudi Arabia is the only country in the world where American service women are forced to wear the religious uniform of the ruling, you know, the ruling uh, regime in that country. It's the only country where service women have to wear a niqab, 
and they're not allowed to drive, and they have to obey all the other uh, disgraceful laws that apply in that country. Jewish Americans have been banned uh, from serving in Saudi Arabia as, as in um, respect for the Saudi um, the ruling class's uh, prejudices uh, and cultural sensitivities, is the way it's worded. And this was challenged in a legal document, an illegal challenge in the 80s, uh, and, and the, the, the High Court or Supreme Court of America overturned it. But in practice, still, the American government basically forbids uh, Jewish Americans from working in Saudi Arabia. Um, and there's one particular incident which I found really, really funny, uh, which was documented by Daniel Pipes, who's a really neoconservative prick. Uh, he really doesn't like uh, America tailing anyone. And he said, he cited this incident where an American soldier uh, based in Saudi Arabia had their wallet confiscated and searched because uh, he was accused of having a picture of his partner wearing hot pants. Uh, and this was seen to be degrading the moral character of Saudi society. And this search was done not by the Saudis, but by his commanding officer. Okay, so why do the Americans go along with this uh, prejudice and, and ridiculous kind of idiocy? Um, uh, the pro-Russian commentators, uh, such as the Global Research website, which is the website which blamed and accused the Syrian rebels of bombing themselves with nerve gas, um, Russia Today and Pravda, um, no relation to our Pravda, of course, regularly churn out articles saying that the, Ru the Saudi, Saudi government has basically co-opted the Americans uh, and, and bought them off with oil. Uh, and this is a view shared, with, uh, shared by Michael Moore, who people have seen that film, uh, Fahrenheit 9-11, uh, which is that great scene, shiny, happy people with the Saudi princes and George Bush. Yeah, like they basically all argue that the Saudis, you know, basically control America via oil uh, and, and capital. Um, it's an argument similar to those around the Zionist lobby, but it's around the Saudi oil kind of shapes. Um, then on the other extreme, there's people who basically assert that Saudi Arabia is a client state uh, for the Americans, that pretty much everything it does is planned by the CIA and by the American government, and then it's the 51st state or the 52nd state, I always forget how many states America has, of America. <laughs> um, and I think both characterizations are wrong. I think uh, though the Saudi regime has been a close ally and, and, and kind of collaborated with the Americans, it has always had interests of its own uh, which have aligned with the Americans, but often, well, sometimes been divergent. Um, and I think that's, that's potentially going to be expanding as the Saudi economy becomes more and more uh, diverse and self-reliant. As a basis for this analysis, I'm going to draw on a great book um, by Adam Hanee, who was a member of the DSP, I think, uh, and is now living, uh, I think, in the West Bank, called uh, Class, and, Class and Capitalism in the Gulf States. Uh, it's an excellent book. Uh, it provides a basic understanding of the economic underpinnings of Saudi society. And he argues that Saudi, society, Saudi capitalism and the Saudi regime have played a key role in integrating the Middle East into a, a nexus of global capital accumulation, and in particular, look, look, looks at countries like Egypt, uh, the Palestinian West Bank, and finance in the, in the region. And so the talk is going to be in three parts. First, I'm going to discuss the political economy of the Saudi state and Saudi society. Then I'll look at the role in the region that it's played across time. And finally, look at the contradictions and challenges that it faces. OK, so oil is the obvious underpinning of Saudi society historically. Uh, it's the second biggest or third biggest, it kind of fluctuates, uh, producer of oil, but it's the biggest exporter by some way because Russia and America, the other two big producers, consume a lot of what they produce. It also controls about a quarter of global oil reserves currently known, and it's the major player in OPEC, which is the institution which controls, or, or tries to control, and largely succeeds, to regulate oil prices at a global level. Um, and although there's been a conscious strategy of diversification in recent times, uh, a whole bunch of petrochemical products have been developed and steel and concrete, aluminium. Still today, 90% uh, of, of Saudi exports, the $400 billion of exports they do every year, are uh, in petrol-related products. So you can see this is an extremely uh, imbalanced economy. But I think it's wrong to see that it's only oil that makes Saudi Arabia significant, uh, economically speaking. Uh, have people heard of the concept of petrodollars? It's extremely important. It's basically the fact that when you sell a fuckload of oil on the world market, you get a lot of dollars in return for that oil. Um, and, in, <laughs> and in 1974, um, 1974, the Saudis did a deal with the Americans to ensure that every single barrel of oil sold on the world market would be denominated in US dollars. So that means American dollars would have to be used to purchase Saudi oil. 
Now, for those who know a little bit about economic history, 1974 is the year that the bread and wood system was, was abolished, the gold standard was cut. And so this underpinning of the global economy and of the, of the US dollar of the, on the oil trade has been significant in strengthening US hegemony in the financial sector for decades now. And, and it is the region that America, it's the reason, sorry, why America can print money happily knowing there's always going to be a global supply, a global demand, uh, which gives it enormous power on the global scale. And so that strengthens the Americans. On the other hand, then the Saudis end up with hundreds of billions of dollars of, of US money, of, 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 sorry, of US dollars, which they can spend and play with. So a large section of that goes to domestic capital, domestic investments, all that kind of thing. But then they have a hell of a lot left over. And so they've been investing, and where better to invest than the United States? Um, so the Saudis have been a key lender to the American financial sector. Um, and so what you see then is this economic relationship that begins to emerge where both countries have an incentive for the American, American markets to remain strong. Both countries have an incentive for the US dollar to remain strong. And both countries therefore have an incentive for the oil trade to remain strong. And this is really the economic reason uh, for the long-term geopolitical relationship between the Saudis and the Americans. So, the structure of Saudi society. Um, I guess there's three kind of tiers to it. The first is the tiny ruling class. Um, well, well, actually not so tiny these days. Uh, there's, um, this is the ruling class that originated in uh, royal structures that were imposed on this region uh, by the British. Um, and basically what the British did was they looked at the pre-existing social structures that existed in these societies um, and they imposed capitalist relations on them. And so this formation of capitalist society in Saudi Arabia is through combined and uneven development. It's a good example of combined and uneven development where these kind of pre-capitalist institutions were strengthened and, and kind of recreated as a basis for a capitalist state. Now this royal family was extremely small to begin with, but over time it realised in order to survive it had to broaden its social base. And so what it's, what it's began to do is redistribute wealth um, to a broader and broader range of people. And this has been done primarily to a ruling, well first of all to a ruling elite, a ruling class, which has been constructed around the royal family and as part of the royal family. Some of the extravagant ways they do this. Um, agriculture in Saudi Arabia. People can see, um, there's amazing Google images of the agricultural sector that's been created in the middle of the desert. Absolute desert and then there's perfect circles of green. You can see it on Google Maps. And basically what happened in the 80s is the Saudi government purchased wheat of Saudi farmers for $1,050 per ton, while the market price globally was $120 a ton. So what is this? This is total subsidies, billions of dollars going to agricultural corporations to start up, to set up. And what this is about, really, is about the Saudi ruling family entrenching its power by gaining a social base. There's also a government department whose job it is to manage welfare for the Saudi royal family. Um, and one estimate is that they spend about $2 billion a year on payments to Saudi royals of various types. And, this is, and you can see why it adds up to so much. This is a country where one in every thousand per, per people is a royal family member. Um, so it's a hell of a lot of princes and princesses. Um, and it's important to see that, uh, although... Actually, I'll leave that for later. Okay, the other main part of the ruling class of Saudi Arabia um, are the heads of the religious institutions which make up uh, the kind of ideological backbone of the regime. And these, these religious institutions, while they're in collaboration with the regime, there can be some tensions between them. They, are, they much more believe their own bullshit uh, than the royal family itself. And so while the, the last king, for example, tried to you know, nudge society forward, as the Christine, Christine Lagarde of the IMF said, uh, the, the religious institutions, which believe to some extent that they're actually trying to set up an Islamic uh, state, try and repress that. And so there can be conflicts between these two things. But in general, the religious institutions provide the shock troops, both ideologically and politically, for the regime to maintain its base. So that's the top tier of Saudi society. The second tier is the citizenry. Uh, to be a citizen of Saudi Arabia, it's an impossible thing to become unless you're born into it. Uh, you cannot be given Saudi citizenship uh, in any other way. Um, some people have been given honorary residency, uh, which is different to citizenship. Um, and the reason this is, it's used to control and co-opt the population. And basically, citizens of Saudi Arabia, to varying extents, there's still a class, class divide between them, uh, even, uh, even apart from the royal family. 
they all receive privileges and, and wealth, basically, from the oil sector of, that Saudi Arabia enjoys. Um, for example, in 2011, when the Arab Spring began in Tunisia and Egypt, the government spent $138 billion, just like that, um, in, in the space of a couple of months. They constructed 600,000 homes and just gave them away. Uh, they created 60,000 new jobs in security, and, and you know, that way kill two birds with one stone. One, you get a repressive apparatus for domestic uses, and two, you make a bunch of people happy because they have a job. And this is just like, just like that, they can do that. Tap into their reserves, uh, and so on. This, this year, um, the old king died. It's a sad day for all of us. And the new king decided to grant uh, the population of Saudi Arabia a 15% bonus on their annual incomes. Again, just like that, to celebrate, uh, to celebrate his, his ascension to the throne. Uh, it was a wonderful day for all Saudi Arabians. But this is the capacity of a society based on the kind of wealth. Uh, yeah. Women are extremely impressed in Saudi Arabia, um, like disgustingly so. Only 6% of women are allowed to work uh, because there's an appalling set of restrictions. Uh, not allowed to drive, not allowed to talk to men outside their immediate family in public, not allowed to travel with men uh, in public, again, outside the immediate family, not allowed to work, again, with people apart from the immediate family. And so this means that basically no one can do it. Um, and so therefore, economic dependence on, for women is, 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 a, you know, is almost absolute. I would qualify that, though. The ruling class, ruling class women don't have it so tough. Um, there was a great article in one journal called Saudis Gone Wild, um, and, and about a group of women who went to America um, to go shopping. And they brought with them a chest filled with $20 million in cash, in $100 bills, and spent it in seven weeks. Um, which probably explains why a Saudi Arabian society purchases about 75% of high fashion in the world. That's Saudi Arabia, fashion capital. Um, so that's, that's really beneath the kind of uh, religious exterior of the ruling class society. So, but, but of course, for women citizens, it's, it's horrific. Um, so there you have the ruling class, you have the citizenry. Um, the final category of Saudi society, the people who do the majority of, of real work um, are not the citizens. They're actually a population of foreign workers. Um, and in particular from south, the subcontinent, so India, Bangladesh, uh, and so on. So why is this the case? This is quite a unique phenomenon. Migrant workers in Saudi Arabia are about 9 million people in a population of about 18 and a half million people. So a third of the population are these migrant workers. And it's actually a very conscious strategy adopted by the Saudis uh, in the kind of 60s and 70s, uh, and, expanding, and constantly expanding really, to, to deal with the fact that the citizens were getting a bit uh, unrest, unrestful. And they realised as kind of nationalist movements spread the, across the Arab world, and including Saudi Arabia, uh, they realised the oil industry was pretty vulnerable based on the fact that people with rights <laughs> were working in it. So they decided, rather than have citizens who had rights to some extent, better to employ a whole, ho a whole bunch of people who you could deport at any time. So this is an incredibly intelligent strategy where every time you have unemployment, you deport people. Every time there's a strike, deport them. Every time they there's a protest, deport them. Incredible social control. It's a really pure form uh, of exploitation. It's almost indentured, well, really, it's indentured labour. Uh, the human cost of this strategy is enormous. Um, domestic workers uh, face incredible hardship. They get locked at home. Their, their owners, which is what they are, really, they take their passports, their phones, they lock them in the house, they beat them. There's often stories of, like, men raping women, domestic workers, and then women... Uh, the partners of the men beating up the women for being sluts. You know, like, incredibly brutal environment. If you run away from the home, you're not allowed to leave Saudi Arabia unless you get the signature of the boss. So then you get put in prison until the boss decides to let you go. Like, it's, it's really brutal. Um, and going back to the story, story about the Saudi women who went shopping in New York, um, they brought their women servants along with them, and though they came out from the plane dressed in whatever fashion... Uh, their servants were forced to continue wearing the niqab, were beaten in public, uh, and so on. So this is a barbaric society and the way it treats the working class, or a substantial section of the working class. The other thing is, it's not just domestic labour, construction work, uh, oil industry, a whole bunch of really key in industrial sectors are staffed by foreign workers uh, whose, whose lives are treated like dirt. They're expendable, they die, they use beds in shifts, so you have eight, 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 you work in shifts, you, you share the same bed, and so on. And if you die, there's no compensation. And so this system, of kind of three-tier system, 
allows the Saudi ruling class and the Saudi bourgeoisie um, to save enormous amounts of money. They don't have to provide any services for these people, they have no rights, and they can be deported, and they're hyper-exploited well beyond the average kind of uh, way in which other workers in that country are. Okay, so now its role in the region, uh, its projection of its power. Um, the US-Saudi kind of nexus has been a really significant force uh, for capital accumulation in the region. Uh, and it's been an extremely conservative force uh, trying to st stabilise and defend the status quo at almost every turn. Uh, when Jamal Abdel Nasser in the 60s came to power in Egypt, the Saudis, he was a nationalist, kind of, yeah, progressive nationalist leader, uh, did a whole bunch of things to modernise Egypt and the Middle East. Um, the Saudis tried to assassinate him initially, uh, and after this 1967 war in which he was thoroughly defeated, they basically held aid over his head in order to moderate him uh, and so on. And when, when Nasser died, um, his followers were, were thoroughly uh, you know, co-opted and funded by the Saudis to go down a neoliberal path. They, they supported them, they gave them more aid every time they did a deal with Israel and so on. So the Saudis were the key agent pushing Egypt and the Egyptian ruling class towards a trajectory of alliance with America, Israel and so on. And this means today that the Saudi relations with the Egyptian uh, ruling class, primarily the deep state, the Egyptian military, are extremely close. Um, if you remember, the mil Egyptian military owns and controls between about 20 and 40 percent of the economy of Egypt. The fact that this military is based on Saudi funds historically and has an extremely close relationship with Saudi Arabia gives you a picture of the significance of Saudi uh, involvement in that country. Remember, the largest country in the Middle East, the biggest army, and so on. And there's similar stories all around the region. I don't have time to go through all of them. Uh, I think the Palestinian story is an, an important one as well, though. I mean, the Saudis today are one of the key backers of the PA in the West Bank, one of the key backers of these parasites, really. Um, and, and you can see the extent of their conservatism and their, their hostility to anyone who remotely fights Israel. Uh, when, when the coalition of the willing started bombing Yemen, Mahmoud Abbas, the leader of the PA, put out a statement saying, Oh, that's good. Yeah, good. Do that. That's great. We don't like those Yemenis. You should also bomb Gaza because Hamas, you know, they're so sectarian, they're so Islamist, etc. So that's, that's the idea of the PA. That's the kind of politics that it absorbs from Saudi Arabia, I think. And a lot of, what, a lot of, what, a lot of these things, and uh, in general what Saudi Arabia has done, have been in line with American interests. Um, but I think it's important to see it's not all love and rainbows between the two nations. Um, 1973... Uh, there was a big oil shock where Saudi Arabia was part of the OPEC, uh, not OPEC, sorry, the Arab states' decision to put an embargo on trading of oil with America, which America certainly didn't like. Uh, and, rather, and far from being some uh, sincere expression of solidarity with the struggle against Israel that was taking place at that time, uh, it was actually just a, a posture to try and deflect uh, the criticism that Saudi Arabia was getting from the sort of radical, uh, radical forces in the Middle East at the time. It was also a way of gaining prestige because Saudi Arabia was also trying to set up an Islamist alternative to the Arab nationalist movement. And doing this was a way of saying, look, you know, radical Muslims, we can do it too. Don't worry about the nationalists. But on further examination, this embargo is less significant than it seems. Actually, when they found out that um, the American fleet in the Gulf was running out of uh, oil and the Saudis were taking over, taking over some space, uh, they, they did a deal, a secret deal with the CIA to fund uh, to give oil for free to the, um, to, the, to the American Navy station in that region, as long as they promise not to tell anyone. There's also a story of the Saudi king seating, sitting down his princes uh, around a table and watching. There was, there was um, footage of uh, the Americans giving Israel tanks, like airlifting tanks and so on, to defend themselves, so-called, against the Arab armies. The Saudi king sat down his princes, screened this footage and said, look, this is why we need America. This is why we need to be on their side. One day we will need this kind of support. So... Although this was a kind of stand against the US, it was far from a, a total one, and I think that reflects the, the relationship quite closely. Um, I think today, uh, in Yemen, it's not clear exactly the Americans' attitude to the situation. Uh, there's been some articles saying the Americans are more concerned with, with Al-Qaeda and ISIS than they are with the Houthis, but clearly the Americans are also prepared to support the Saudis, and so this relationship of, of support, uh, although it's not a perfect harmony, I think characterises the situation. One aspect of, of Saudi Arabia's foreign policy, which is worth exploring, is the uh, sectarianism, the extreme sectarianism of everything they do and everything they touch. Um, and I think it's important to talk about sectarianism because it's something we 
you know, the left doesn't like talking about it to some extent because we see it as a kind of orientalist approach to the Middle East, and there's some validity to that. Like a lot of the reports about the Middle East are extremely reductive in the way they analyse situations. Sunni versus Shia, this always happened, and so on. But the reality is that sectarianism is a product of capitalism in the Middle East. It is an expression of the fact that capitalism imposed itself on these societies in such a way, using the pre-existing relations to, uh, to basically entrench itself in a way that suited the interests of the ruling elites. So the French in Syria, for example, gave the Alawites autonomy, gave the Druze autonomy in a way to kind of weaken and divide that country. Uh, in Lebanon, I mean, they created Lebanon to weaken that country. They created Israel um, to create a loyal base in the region as well. That was the British. Um, it, more recently, the Americans' approach in Iraq it's consciously to balance the various forces against each other. And so this sectarianism that we see is a product of that. But I think it's also wrong to say it's only foreign intervention. I think the domestic ruling classes of this region uh, have increasingly turned to sectarianism uh, to, to shore up their rule. Um, it's a myth that the, the radical republics, as they're called, were ever purely secular. Um, but countries like Saudi Arabia have been the most viciously sectarian. And I think it's important to see for them, sectarianism functions in much the way that nationalism functions here in Australia. It's a way of dividing, it's a way of uniting people across class lines, uh, creating imaginary communities which can then be used against other forces and obscuring the real class relations which exist. And um, the Saudis have been the most passionate advocates for this kind of sectarian policy. Um, for example, they spend, I saw one statistic, uh, they've spent about $100 billion according to one estimate on funding Wahhabi religious institutions since 1975. $100 billion. That averages about $2 to $3 billion a year on ideological uh, expansion. And clearly the Saudis are not spending this money because they believe in Islam and they want to spread the message of God or whatever. Um, clearly some people are religious and whatever. The Saudis are doing this to build networks of control, of influence. This is soft power in the classic sense of the term. And the specific Saudi brand, 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 brand of um, sectarianism, of, of Wahhabi Islam, is particularly divisive and intolerant. And they, cult they consciously cultivate the kind of most brutal elements uh, of, 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 of any kind of Muslim community. They cultivate them in order to make them uh, allies of the Saudi regime. Um, and they then, they then turn these, turn these organisations against rival communities, which they see as inherently linked to Iran. So then you see the Sunni Shiite thing, not as some eternal... Uh, situation in the Middle East, but as a, a strategy that is used by domestic ruling classes as well as foreign in order to control the region. And I think the Saudi and the US, uh, the US are to blame more than anyone else in the current context. Unfortunately, though, it's not as simple as just saying this is imposed as well from these countries, because once you set up a situation where you have these institutions running around d defining themselves in such sectarian terms, they then oppress other people on the basis of sectarian divisions. Those other people then feel legitimately we're being oppressed on the basis of our religious views. Then they turn, develop a counter-identity. And so then you have this sort of self-sustaining conflict, uh, which is really tragic and, and hard to break out of. And so I think the creation of ISIS is a, is a kind of horrific coming together of the ensemble of war, occupation, economic crisis, the defeat of the Arab Spring, all this stuff coming together, uh, all of it harnessed and strengthened by the sectarianism of the forces in the region. Okay, so what are, just to begin to wrap up, what are the kind of contradictions and tensions facing the Saudi regime? Well, internationally and then domestically. On the international front, um, there are, there's kind of potential divergence on some fronts. Uh, between the Americans and the Saudis in the medium term. For example, the fact that the Americans are producing more oil uh, these days and the fact that the Saudis actually sell to China more than they do to America is one source of potential tension. Um, and, but this is really, really limited, and I think we don't want to go too far. For one thing, the Saudis have a really limited military capacity. Um, they need the Americans. They have an infantry of about 230,000, in comparison, the Turks have about 315,000 and Iran has 700,000. So the, the Saudis, despite their significant economic um, presence in the region and their, and their links to a whole bunch of countries, uh, they're militarily not the most powerful. They possess a whole bunch of you know, equipment which they actually don't know how to use. Uh, they keep purchasing fighter planes, 
all this kind of stuff. They don't have the pilots to fly these things. Um, and it's actually more about posturing and, and financial reciprocity with the Americans than it is seriously about, um, about imposing their power. On the other hand, they're clearly trying to build a military. Um, from the American perspective, Saudi oil remains the cheapest um, source and I think will remain a key, a key avenue for American energy security as they see it. So I think uh, we shouldn't go too far down the path of seeing there being any really significant divergence. I mean, the other factor is the, the growth of Iran, which I think was talked about in other sessions. We can discuss that in, in the discussion because I'm going to run out of time. Um, Turkey is another force in the region that's extreme, extre increasingly assertive. But again, like you write these talks and then in the Middle East everything changes. So now with the coalition against Yemen, there's a potential rapprochement between Turkey, um, the Muslim Brotherhood, Qatar, Saudis, because now they're more concerned about the growth of Iran. So, you know, these alliances chop and change. But needless to say, the fact that the Middle East is so unstable and in such flux, the fact that there's these, all these powers vying for influence means the Saudi uh, hegemony is at risk and is constantly unstable. ISIS is another risk. I mean, although ISIS is much less powerful than these countries, ISIS doesn't really play by the rules of international relations. And so while Iran, is uh, so Iran or uh, Turkey is unlikely just to assassinate the Saudi regime or whatever, ISIS is much more capable of acting in such a way, which I think, given the brittleness, the kind of brittle Saudi state, such behaviour could be quite destabilising. And I think that's the reason why the Americans are quite concerned with the growth of ISIS. I think the overwhelming factor is the, their, their concern for the Saudis, uh, not for anything that's going on in Syria or Iraq. Um, OK, so we need to look at the domestic sphere as well, because as Marxists, we have to always see the working class as agents for change, not only what's going on between the ruling class. The first thing is um, the growing population of young citizens in Saudi Arabia. Um, this strategy of employing foreign labour uh, has been great for the ruling class to an extent, but now uh, unemployment among young people... I saw... A, there, there's actually, 51% of Saudi citizens are below the age of 25. So 51% of the population are young. And among this population, 28% by the government's own stats are unemployed. 28%. So I can't do that math. Someone else can. That's quite a lot of unemployed people. Um, and these people are not happy with the regime as a result. Um, as a result, they're trying, to, they're trying to turn towards employing these people. But if you then phase out foreign labour and phase in domestic labour, well, then you create a regular exploitation relationship, and we all know where that can hopefully go. There's another tension, which is um, the, the liberal education that's being achieved by a growing section of the Saudi upper middle class and ruling class. Um, there's more scholarships overseas, all this kind of stuff. And in these societies, people are taught all the rubbish that we're taught, but essentially there is a more liberal experience than there is in Saudi Arabia. And so there can be a tension between these young people and their, even though they're part of the, they're not part of some radical section of society, but their basic desires for liberalisation can go up against the kind of the normative, uh, the established norms of, of Saudi society as, in, as imposed by both the royal family but also the clergy. And that can lead to tension. Then there's discrimination against the Shiite population. Shiites in Saudi Arabia are about 10 to 15 to 20 percent of the population. It's hard to get an exact reading. They're not allowed to teach about half the subjects in schools because half the subjects in schools are related to religion and therefore Shiites are you know, not part of the Sunni religion and so they can't teach. They're not allowed to be military officers because the Saudi regime is extremely concerned about having a kind of politicised officer corps learning from the situation in Egypt back in the day. So they don't allow Shiites to become military officers uh, and a whole bunch of different aspects of society. They're often seen as a fifth column of Iran and this means that, well that inherently politicises them uh, because they're fucked over in a systematic way. Um, the final thing is the foreign workers themselves have, have become uh, and are um, agents in, them, in themselves. Um, incredible numbers. We're talking 9 million people. Um, the, although they're extremely oppressed, there are tensions and just unescapable realities. When you're oppressed to the extent that the peace people are, there will be resistance. And the last couple of years, there's been a few interesting examples. Um, a couple, two years ago, in 2013... The government uh, went on a, a kind of uh, paper check, like what's the fucking word for it? Anyway, they went around checking everyone's documents to see, to see who's a legitimate foreign worker and who's not. And they deported about a couple hundred thousand people. This is how it works, these numbers are staggering, but it just routinely happens. 
Two, three hundred thousand people are deported from Saudi Arabia for lacking documentation. But in this process, everything shut down. Bakeries, schools, hospitals, construction sites, everything shut down. Not because there was a strike, but because workers were worried about being deported, and so all these foreign workers hid, essentially. And so you had the effect of a general strike without the consciousness of it. Um, so I guess we can see a weakness here, but obviously a strength. There is enormous power in this kind of society. There was also, there was also clashes of police, as some more intrepid protesters came out and, and opposed the attacks and demanded rights and so on. And there were massive clashes of police, three people died, and so on. But you can see here there's an implicit power purely in the fact that these people are exploited and are necessary for the Saudi society to function. And so I think at both regional and domestic levels, although the Saudi regime seems to be stable, uh, there are a number of tensions and challenges that it faces in trying to manage its, manage its government, manage its society uh, in the near future, in the coming future. Yep. So to conclude, I think understanding Saudi Arabia is crucial, as I said to begin with, to understanding the Middle East. It's been central to the development of politics in the region. And in particular, what's called the Mashrit, so from here to this kind of area, Saudi Arabia sees that as its backyard. So Egypt, Lebanon, Palestine, Syria. Uh, and these are you know, quite politically central and economically central as well. Um, it's been the linchpin of US strategy in the region for decades now. Saudi Arabia has been one of the key props alongside Israel and the Egyptians um, as, as an attempt to safeguard the interests of capital in the region. And the importance of this role was highlighted in the Arab Spring, um, as I think other sessions would have discussed. Uh, it was not the Israelis who crushed the Arab Spring. It was not the Americans who crushed the Arab Spring. It was counter-revolutionary regimes in the region, backed largely by Saudi Arabia, where they weren't directly intervening themselves. So in Bahrain, the people of Bahrain were physically crushed by the Saudis. But elsewhere, they were crushed by forces supported by the Saudis. Um, and this indigenous bourgeoisie can actually play a much more damaging role than Israeli, Israeli capital or even American capital uh, in the medium term. And so the challenge in the Middle East is to build a force that can smash uh, the Saudi state, but before that really build a movement that can smash sectarianism, the, the divisive ideas that have been trenched by regimes like Saudi Arabia. The, kind of, the, the national divides, the sectarian divides, the, grieve, the local grievances, all of which have been created and strengthened by the counter-revolution in the Middle East and the sectarian policies of the ruling classes, the left has to try and rebuild a movement that can unite people across those lines. And Marxists have always argued the Middle East has to be seen as a totality um, and that the Arab masses, in order to be free, need to bring down the totality of imperialism and capitalism in the region. This is always symbolised by the slogan, the road to a free Palestine runs through Cairo. Um, but I think it's become increasingly apparent the road really to Cairo runs through Riyadh and Saudi Arabia without overthrowing and challenging the Saudi monarchy, I think it's going to be difficult to see uh, a free Middle East. And that's going to be the long-term strategy and plan for the Arab left. 